Hi folks, Astronomy Live here. A couple weeks ago, I drove out to a remote location on a road that runs due north and south. I set up my telescope and commanded it to point at 90 degrees positive declination, the North Celestial Pole. I then turned off the tracking and let it take an image for about nine and a half minutes. These images were taken with my Canon T5i and an Orion ST80 refractor riding piggyback on top of the main telescope. This was to recreate an image that I took 11 years ago on January 10, 2012 using that same Orion refractor and what I had at the time, a Canon XTI SLR, a very similar camera. Here is the EXIF data for one of the new images that I took on January 8, 2023 at 5.11 Universal Time. Do note that in these images the camera is set to universal time, so that's the time shown in the EXIF data, and note that the exposure is the same, 572 seconds. Let's now compare the image taken in 2023 to the image that I first took in 2012. Here is the image that I took on January 10th, 2012. Note the very bright star in the upper left, that is Polaris. And now, as I crossfade it to the image taken in 2023, note that the trails have slightly changed. The star trail of Polaris is slightly shorter now, and the star trails on the right side of the image have lengthened. That's because the North Celestial Pole has moved due to precession, and it's now actually a little bit closer to Polaris than it was 11 years ago. Now, as I fade back and forth between them, you can see this motion quite clearly. We can use astrometry to measure this motion, and we can calculate the expected amount of precession over this time period and actually display where the North Celestial Pole was expected to be in these images and see if it lines up with these concentric circles of star trails. Here is a spreadsheet I created to calculate precession. You can find a link to the spreadsheet in the video description. You put in your time and location on the left side, and then coordinates at a reference epoch of J2000 to get coordinates processed to the equinox of date. J2000 is noon on the Gregorian calendar on January 1st in the year 2000, and the equinox of date corresponds to the coordinates processed to the time you have entered on the input column on the left side. First up, I've calculated the coordinates of the North Celestial Pole for the image taken in 2012, and then you can see that at the equinox of date, this corresponds to a declination of basically 90 degrees. However, it's slightly different in J2000, and those are the coordinates we actually need to enter into the software to see where it is in the image, because the image has been astrometrically solved using J2000 coordinates. Next, we need to look up the coordinates for Polaris, and in order to avoid any accusations of shenanigans, I'm going to actually reference an old copy of Norton's Star Atlas that I've had in my collection since 2004. We can find the J2000 coordinates for Polaris under the listing for double stars in charts 1 and 2, and you can see here it's shown as 2 hours, 31.8 minutes right ascension, positive 89 degrees, 16 minutes declination. If we take the coordinates for Polaris and plug them into our spreadsheet, we can see that the separation of Polaris from the North Celestial Pole is predicted to be about 0.681 degrees at this time. We can then take the astrometrically solved picture from 2012 and load it into SAO Image DS9. This allows us to display the coordinates in the image. We can then create a circle with the center point equal to the coordinates we calculated for the North Celestial Pole and set the radius equal to the expected distance of Polaris from the North Celestial Pole. What we get is a circle that is concentric with the star trails, indicating that the North Celestial Pole is where it was expected to be and we see that this circle passes through Polaris as expected, indicating that the North Celestial Pole is indeed at the expected distance from Polaris at this time. We then repeat this process for the new image taken in 2023, first by calculating the coordinates of the North Celestial Pole at the time that I took the image. I once again plug in the coordinates of Polaris and take 90 degrees minus the declination to find the separation from the North Celestial Pole at the time that the new image was taken. This will be the radius of another circle that we will draw in the new image. Once again, we plug in these numbers into SA Image DS9 with the new 2023 image, and once again we see that we get a circle that is concentric with the star trails in the image and also passes through Polaris in the image. 
Now, when I load the circle for the 2012 image into the 2023 image, you can see that both circles pass through Polaris because Polaris is at the expected separation from the coordinates of the NCP in both cases. However, the coordinates of the NCP from 2012 no longer correspond to its current location, so these two circles are not concentric, and more importantly, the 2012 circle is not concentric with the star trails that we see in the image. Let's now zoom in on the center of this image and reduce the radius of these circles to take a closer look at the position of the North Celestial Pole and how it's moved over the last 11 years. We've zoomed in here to the point that we can't even see Polaris, but you can very clearly see that the 2012 NCP circle is not concentric with the star trails in this image, whereas the 2023 NCP circle is. You can also see a small dot almost exactly in the center of the image. That is a star that is very close to the current location of the North Celestial Pole, much closer than Polaris, which is almost two-thirds of a degree away from the North Celestial Pole. But it's much dimmer than anything we can see by eye. Now I want to zoom back out and show you Polaris one more time, because there's another aspect of these two circles I want to talk about. It's very obvious, but as you can see, the 2012 circle is a larger circle than the 2023 circle, because as the North Celestial Pole moves closer to Polaris, the circle that Polaris traces out over the course of 24 hours gets smaller. By eye, most people see the North Star and they think it's always in the same spot in the sky. In reality, over the course of the night, it will actually trace out a small circle around the North Celestial Pole, and with a telescope, as you can see, the circle's radius becomes quite large and very noticeable. So let's suppose for a second that you have a stone in the ground, and you've drilled a hole through this stone at an angle equal to the latitude of the site the stone is placed. You should see Polaris through the stone, right? Well, if you've drilled the hole large enough to fit Polaris so that it's always visible every night, all year round, through this hole, then by definition, you have drilled a hole large enough to fit the separation between Polaris and the North Celestial Pole. Now, this very picture was taken at the Georgic Guidestones and shows a hole that was drilled in that manner. So how long would this hole continue to work and continue to show you Polaris through the hole every night? Well, the Georgia Guide Stones were apparently destroyed, but if you rebuilt them right now, and you drilled it with a radius equal to the separation between Polaris and the North Celestial Pole as it exists today, you would see it continue to function for over 150 years, because that's how long it's going to take precession to move the North Celestial Pole past Polaris and out to the same radius that it sits at today. Now, as this implies, Polaris will not always be the North Star, and historically it hasn't always been the North Star. There have been other stars that have taken that mantle and been aligned closer with the North Celestial Pole than Polaris is even now. Thuban is one such example that the ancient Egyptians used. Going back to our telescopic example, in the middle of this image is this unremarkable magnitude 14 star with the following USNO designation. Totally unremarkable, except for the fact that it is very close to the current location of the North Celestial Pole. Even back as early as 2012, it wasn't quite as close to the North Celestial Pole, and it did start to trace out a small semicircle, as you can see with other stars that are a little bit further away. Now, as I move north or south of the location where I took this photo, that little star and the North Celestial Pole should move by a corresponding amount in altitude relative to the horizon. In other words, if I measure the elevation of that star and the North Celestial Pole, it should correlate with my latitude on Earth. A similar methodology allowed Eratosthenes to measure the circumference of Earth thousands of years ago using the Sun. But Flat Earthers claim he was in fact measuring the altitude of a Sun over a flat Earth. If we use the North Celestial Pole's current location as a proxy for this little star, and travel north or south of our starting location and take a new elevation measurement, we should be able to measure the altitude of this star above a flat Earth if we assume that Earth is indeed flat, right? So let's see what happens when we do that. After all, that nice big 11-inch telescope that the Orion ST80 has been riding piggyback on has been doing a whole lot of nothing while I've been taking these pictures. But that telescope has some nice new electronics on it that allow us to measure the elevation of the North Celestial Pole. 
so let's take a look. For reference, here's the picture taken by the Orion ST-80 over 9.5 minutes while it was riding piggyback. We can see the North Celestial Pole is in the middle of the view. So what elevation is this over the horizon? According to the telescope's hand controller, it was pointing 27 degrees 7 minutes 11 seconds above the horizon, due north, 0 degrees azimuth. And for further confirmation, the hand controller also reported that it was pointing 90 degrees positive declination at the North Celestial Pole, which is what we saw in the photo. I then drove three miles due south and stopped at a second location to set up the telescope once more. I leveled the telescope and set it up once again and pointed it at positive 90 degrees declination, facing the North Celestial Pole to take another 9.5 minute image. We see once again that the telescope is pointed at the North Celestial Pole, with the stars tracing circles concentrically around that point. The telescope now reports that it's pointing at an altitude over the horizon of 27 degrees, 4 minutes, 35 seconds. Converting these readings to decimal degrees, we find that that little dot in the North Celestial Pole was 27.11972 degrees above the horizon at our first location, and 27.07639 degrees above the second location, 3 miles south. That equals an altitude difference between the two locations of 0.04333 degrees. We can use the law of signs now to find the slant range between the telescope and the star, assuming that we're on a flat Earth. 3 miles times the sine of 27.07639 degrees divided by the sine of 0.04333 degrees equals a slant range of 1806 miles. But you see, there's a little problem with this finding, because from my location in Florida, it's actually about 4,350 miles to get to the geographic North Pole. The geographic North Pole corresponds to the North Celestial Pole projected down onto the surface of the Earth. Standing at that location, you would have to look straight up 90 degrees to see the North Celestial Pole and that faint little star that we saw. So how can it be that the slant range between the telescope and that star is thousands of miles less than the distance it would take me to travel to the geographic North Pole, knowing that that star is straight up from that location, 90 degrees above the horizon. Because it's a 90 degree angle, we can use a simple cosine function to find the expected distance to the North Pole according to Flat Earth, that is to say the distance it would take to reach the point where you would look straight up to see the North Celestial Pole and that faint little star. According to Flat Earth, I should only have to go about 1607 miles north of my location in Florida to reach the North Pole. In reality, 1,607 miles only gets me as far north as about Smoky Falls, Ontario. Now, of course, this figure is not drawn to scale, but the point it's illustrating is that if we draw this out on a flat Earth, you have to extend these lines coming from the telescope locations past where they actually intersect in order to intersect the line facing straight up from the North Pole. And they intersect that line from the North Pole at two different locations, indicating that they would be giving two different and conflicting altitudes for that faint little star we saw right at the North Celestial Pole. The conclusion we draw from this is to reject Flat Earth. It doesn't work, it doesn't make useful predictions, and it doesn't agree with reality. On a globe Earth, these results make perfect sense. If we take 360 degrees and divide it, by the difference in elevation that we observed the North Celestial Pole and that faint little star of 0 0.04333 degrees, and then multiply this times 3 miles and divide it by 2 times pi, we get a radius of Earth of 3,967 miles, within a few miles of the expected radius of the planet. I hope you enjoyed this brief exploration of our planet's size and motion. If you did, be sure to like and subscribe for more of this type of content, and until next time, Clear skies, folks.